Hey everyone, what's going on? Ash here from ME Odyssey. The dust has just about settled and it's 7 day and we got a bunch of announcements. Two trailers, voice actors confirmed, long awaited backwards compatibility news and more. But because there is a lot to go through, this video will be a bit longer than a normal news update and will solely be focused on summarising the main news that was announced on N7 Day. Game Informer is continuing to release interviews and details throughout November and while we'll be covering the main points of the magazine article in this video, we'll be covering the ongoing news releases by Game Informer as they release them in a separate video. What we'll basically be looking to do is create a mini-series of news roundup videos over the next week or so, so that all the information is easier for you to take in without having to watch basically an hour-long video with everything thrown in all at once. So without further ado, let's get started. So firstly, we're going to jump straight into the NeoGAF thread or the Game Informer article points. Now, luckily, Shinobi from Twitter has on NeoGAF, on his own NeoGAF thread, put up a bunch of points that basically confirm all the details from the Game Informer article without having to read through the entire Game Informer article because it's a very long article. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to read through every single point. I'm just going to say what the sections are, leave them on the screen for a few seconds. You can have a look, pause the video and have a look if you want to or if you don't want to do that you can click the link in the description to the NeoGAF thread and you can read the whole thing for yourself there. So firstly we have little points in regards to backstory that'll actually come up in a later point in this video as well so I won't read through that right now. It also confirms things like Turians being confirmed in the game, that the Helios cluster is noted as having a significant amount of golden worlds or planets that are good for life, there seem to be events at the start of the game that occur that means the Pathfinder ult is passed down to you, which is where the whole untested and unproven thing from previous releases has come from. From what we've heard and what's been confirmed in this article, there is a bunch more customization options than there have been in previous games. You can also customize your father and your sibling, although not as extensively as yourself. Anyone wondering about that huge ship, the Nexus, that is basically our main command center. As you can see by this picture on the screen, the Nexus, when I say it's huge, it's absolutely huge. Look at this picture here, there's the Nexus, and in the center there is one of the arcs. These things are massive. And it seems like in the main part of the story in the game, the Hyperion is going to be the main focus of this particular game as it gets cut off from the rest of the group heading into the Andromeda Galaxy as it arrives in an incorrect location and it loses contact with the Nexus and the other arcs. Also talked about in the article was different combat situations and different combat skills and how the class systems are gone, but you can have full access to all the different variations that you can have now rather than going through one particular class and a good bunch of stuff that kind of ties into possibly multiplayer later on as well, and customization again, that you can customize your helmet, your chest, shoulders, arms, and legs, and again, just points that it's much more extensive than the original trilogy. For anyone who doesn't know by now, the Ket, which are the creepy, you know, aliens, or the back of the aliens that we saw in the main trailer, uh, the Ket, spelled K-E-T-T, -T, they are the main enemy. And it has been pointed out that the Bioware team wanted players to experience the first time encountering a new alien species versus already having it established in prior games. So obviously in the last Mass Effect trilogy, you basically went in there, a lot of the races that you meet are already established. This one, brand new. And the good thing is, a lot of people have been kind of concerned that there's maybe too much focus on one planet based on this one trailer. At the bottom it does say, some plot threads and missions lead you across multiple planets, so that's good. I mean, you can go from one planet to another. There's no real number at the moment as to how many planets you can actually go on and visit and explore, but I hope it will be fairly numerous, at least, you know, I mean, back when the channel first started, we had a news video where it could have been up to 200, but if they have anywhere between, like, maybe sort of 30 and 100 planets to discover, I think that'd be pretty good for a first game in kind of a new sub-story of the Mass Effect universe. In terms of the Tempest, it's apparently important to harken back to the Normandy as it was a fan favourite, was a fan favourite for me, other than the CRC checkpoint in Mass Effect 3. The interesting thing is there are no loading screens as you move through the ship, which is always good. The galaxy map does return, but rather than piloting a mini ship on a map, it's much more immersive, you get to select a planet, the game gives you a sense of travelling towards that planet, and when you back out, you're immediately at your destination. One thing that people always want to know about in Mass Effect and generally Bioware games is relationships and the characters you can romance. 
and there is a small section here basically confirming things like there are more relationships in the game than in any other Bioware game, which is always good because fans always want to make a big emphasis on the romance in the games. They talk about loyalty missions returning, but they're not critical to the ending of the game. You can complete them after you complete the main story if you want to. They emphasise that relationships don't just culminate in a sex scene, you can get to know characters and be in long term relationships with them if you want to. Uh, some people still won't be interested in you at all if you do make any kind of romantic advances to them. And um, Bioware also wanted to capture the more the Brochep Garrus relationship kind of thing where they're very much you know, best friends and shooting bottles with Garrus kind of thing. So they want to capture that as well, should you not want to go down the romantic route. In terms of the multiplayer, everyone has been kind of thinking about this one. It is basically a more evolved and refined version of Mass Effect 3. There is a card-based economy where you earn XP and credits. This, to me, sounds very similar to Halo 5 and how they do their kind of multiplayer thing. Uh, there are microtransactions, but no real-world money is needed, uh, as you can unlock them normally by gaining in-game credits. This is also something else that's very similar to the Halo 5 uh, multiplayer system as well. Bioware also plans to release custom crafted missions with unique modifiers that players can't change themselves. So these are like challenge modes where you go in but you can't change any of them, of them, you know, modifications on the level or anything like that. You go in and try your best for higher reward. One of the important things it does mention that playing the multiplayer will have advantages for the single player, but it absolutely does not affect the ending of the game, basically referring back to Mass Effect 3. In terms of choices, everyone knows by now that there's no more Paragon or Renegade system. Uh, they want more nuance and subtlety and giving the player more opportunity to actually express themselves. You still can do the old uh, cut in a conversation with the trigger thing though, as in like all the other games. You can agree or disagree with people still. Uh, there are dialogue option tones which are basically being set as go with your heart, go with your head, be professional or be casual. And the decisions you make in the game, they aren't necessarily obvious, right or wrong, but there are pros and cons to each and you just have to play the game the way you want. And in terms of the future of Mass Effect with Mass Effect Andromeda, Mass Effect Andromeda does leave the door open for more games, of course. Uh, there is a new game plus mode which allows you to change your gender if you choose. And Bioware is being coy about the multiple endings, they're saying it's a surprise, it's different than the trilogy. We got to see the cover art for the standard and deluxe editions of the game. The deluxe edition has a picture of Alec Ryder, the confirmed name of Daddy Ryder, looking on at what appears to be an arc struggling in the distance. Then we had the following announcements of the various different editions of the game and what comes with them. We have the standard edition, the deluxe edition and the super deluxe edition. Details of these three different editions come with varying degrees of pre-order bonuses and multiplayer benefits, and two also come with a digital download of the Mass Effect Andromeda soundtrack. It is worth checking pre-order information though, as there is a small amount of confusion with regards to collector's editions and with the ND1 Nomad vehicle, which seems to be sold separately from the game rather than included with it, but there will be some retailers who will join these things together themselves and offer them as a bundle, so keep an eye out for those as well. The prices for these different editions vary, and honestly they are a little confusing, at least in here in the UK anyway, with game offering the Nomad ND1 remote control car and what looks like the standard edition of the game for around £279.99. While in the US the same would set you back around $260. If you're just looking to get the game itself, the standard edition will cost around $60 US and £50 UK. The deluxe edition will cost $70 US and roughly between £55 and £60 UK. And the super deluxe edition has yet to be given a firm price, but we would estimate between $80 to $100 US and between £60 and £90 in the UK. Finally, we reach the pre-order bonuses. The standard edition will get you the Deep Space Explorer armor set, a multiplayer booster pack, which will give you five 50% XP boosters in multiplayer, and you'll get a Nomad skin for your new in-game vehicle. The deluxe edition will get you everything in the standard edition, plus a casual outfit for your Pathfinder, scavenger armor, the Pathfinder Elite weapon set, a pet piejack, one multiplayer deluxe launch pack, and a digital copy of the Mass Effect Andromeda soundtrack. The Super Deluxe Edition will get you everything in the Deluxe Edition, but you'll get 20 of the multiplayer Deluxe launch packs with one being released to you per week for 20 weeks from the date the game launches. 
and you will also get multiplayer super deluxe booster packs, again releasing over a 20 week period from the game's launch. One pack a week to help you boost your ongoing progress in multiplayer. And of course, for those who have been waiting for so long about news of backwards compatibility or a remaster version, we got one of them at least. Mass Effect 2 and 3 are now available for Xbox One on backwards compatibility and are now also in the EA Access Vault for anyone who is subscribed to that service. This announcement personally was bittersweet for me, as it now means I no longer need my Xbox 360, but it's awesome news and we're happy that it's finally happened. Controller support for the PC version of Mass Effect Andromeda has also been confirmed too. So in terms of the voice actors and character names, we've got at least four confirmations on N7Day. Firstly, as Scott Ryder, we have Tom Taylorson, who very awesomely voiced Octodad. As Sarah Ryder, we have Frida Wolf. As Alec Ryder, the father of Scott and Sarah, and the mystery and seven guy that we wanted to know about for so long, everyone guessed it correctly, it's Clancy Brown. And finally, the voice of Jen Garson, the founder of the Andromeda Initiative, we have Jamie Clayton. We also have the first name for this character called Liam. No voice actor confirmed for him yet, but a little bit of backstory is that he has police experience from his time on Earth, so maybe a bit of a security presence for the Andromeda team as they land in Andromeda. Honestly, after listening to some of their work on YouTube and on various projects that they've done in the past, we're actually really excited to see what these four actors will bring to the Mass Effect universe. We still wait on confirmation of the voice actor of the Asari, PV, who we know now has that, has that nickname, but no word on their actual name as of yet because it's not been confirmed. It has been confirmed that more voice actors will be announced soon and to keep an eye on Caroline Livingston's Twitter account for more announcements. So in terms of the Andromeda initiative itself, we have got a little bit of information. It looks like, first of all, that Mass Effect Andromeda is set, according to Matt Walters, just after Mass Effect 2 and before Mass Effect 3. According to the orientation trailer and the Andromeda Initiative website, it says founded in 2176 and launched in 2185, the Andromeda Initiative is a civilian, multi-species project created to send scientists, explorers, colonists on a one-way trip to settle in the Andromeda galaxy. With powerful benefactors lending their support, the program has grown substantially in scope since its inception. The initiative's goal is to establish a permanent presence on the seemingly resource-rich frontier of Andromeda and eventually create a reliable route between it and the Milky Way galaxy. There are five ships in total, four arcs including the Hyperion, and the Nexus, a huge central ship where the majority of the Andromeda initiative are. There will also be a group of people similar to the Council on the Citadel that you will have to report to. There were also two trailers released on N7Day, the new cinematic story trailer and also the orientation trailer as well. We were going to go into more detail on this news video, but we've already done a video each on both the trailers anyway and they've already been released. So if you want to watch them, click on the two annotations at the end of the video to go and watch them as well. So that's a brief summary of the main points that were announced on N7Day. There will also be a gameplay reveal at the Game Awards on December 1st, so be sure to keep an eye out for that, as Jeff Keighley is teasing that he thinks we'll be surprised about how much we're actually going to see in terms of the gameplay. As I mentioned at the beginning, we'll be breaking down all the dev confirmations from Twitter and the ongoing Game Informer releases throughout November in an N7 Day News Roundup mini-series throughout the next week or so and beyond, so be sure to keep an eye on the channel for more information very, very soon. Also, just a very quick thank you to Bioware for sending out these awesome Andromeda Initiative shirts to myself and Rima. We absolutely love them and can't thank you enough for sending them out. That's all for now. Subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on all things Mass Effect and you can help the channel to grow by sharing the video too. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again very soon.